good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN AM for Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022. And our top story today, defined contribution retirement plans seek flexibility. Joining me now to discuss this and a lot more, Bill Ryan is a partner with NEPC. Bill, great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate you having me back. I'm excited to talk to you about my new firm, NEPC, and the great work we're doing with clients. Yeah, let's 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 talk about this survey. I know this is the the 16th year of the NEPC survey. First, what's the survey about? And I have to ask you the question, why is this year different than any year in the past? Yeah, it's a great question. It's different because of the clients. Our clients have done great work with their plans. It's an opportunity for us to aggregate what they're doing as a whole and communicate back to our other clients of what how we're working with them and use it as a straw person for a lot of conversations. And so what's different about it? It's probably growth. Plans are growing both in size and, and in headcount. Uh, the plan this year represents $230 billion and my favorite number, 1.6 million participants. And we've seen over the past five years that the, the plans have grown on median by 67%. So as they increase in headcount, and in dollars, the data gets more and more rich year over year. This year is better than last year. Well, Bill, it sounds like it's, it's you know, we always love when the balances go up, and I think the participants do. Uh, what's the impact on the pandemic to the role of the fiduciary, uh, people like yourselves in NEPC, uh, HR managers, trustees sitting around the table? Uh, what's the impact on retirement plans? Yeah, I think the pandemic had an a, a impact on it similar that we saw in the marketplace over the past two years. So in 2020, when the pandemic first hit, markets went down, there was a change in focus, a uh, big focus on the CARES Act and how to be helpful to participants and how they got distributions, loans, be able to manage their day-to-day -day life. As the markets recovered by the end of 2020, we start to feel like we we're back in a new normal. There were some hiccups, so we got into traditional plan, man plan management. And what we actually see now in 2022 is the headlines of unexpected inflation and those high numbers. We're having conversations of the assets in the plan, probably something we haven't talked about in 10 years, but what's going on with the assets they provide, more specifically, where the target date funds are near retirement, um, what the asset allocation is there, because those are the assets in which individuals, the participants in retirement would take a paycheck and be most sensitive to what we're seeing in today's market. So the pandemic is, uh, you know, it's art imitating life. We're, we're seeing that plan management is similarly following that path. Uh, you know, Bill, are, are fiduciaries, are people responsible for retirement plans, are they seeking greater flexibility when it comes to the record keeping services, the types of investment options that they're offering on the menu um, and, and everything else? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I think we're as kind of using the example of the pandemic as we've actually reset over the past two years, thinking about what's important to us in life and our job function. Flexibility has been extremely important. And in my new role with NEPC as the head of solutions, I'm having a lot more conversations with clients on how they want to manage that plan, what's most important to their core business going forward, which includes tasks they want to continue or things that they want to outsource. So I guess the silver lining, if there was one that came out of the pandemic, was the fact that people are resetting what their responsibilities are and doing the things that they find most interesting. And these that these employers are looking to provide their participants the most rich benefits but maybe flexibility on how they manage it, either in-house or outsourced. Yeah, I mean, and they're probably being colored, I would think, by this great resignation. It's about creating the best benefit possible. Bill, our, our, our target date funds, you know, that you and I are old dogs here now. We've been around since the, before the, pension, the passage of the Pension Protection Act. Target date funds really on that fast trajectory, tra trajectory in terms of growth. Are they still the go-to for the QDIA, the qualified default investment alternative? I they are 100%, or I should say 97% they are. So 97% <laughs> okay. of our clients have a target date fund, and of them, 95% of them have actually picked them as the plan default. And to your point, being the old dogs, we remember when there were zero assets then in 2005. And now there's 44% of plan assets on average are in target date funds. And so I would anticipate uh, they're going to continue to grow in importance over the next decade or so. Yeah, not to date myself, but I had hair back when target date funds first came out. Um, you know, what the, the growth of these assets in target date funds, does it diminish the importance of that core menu? 
Uh, you mentioned, I think for 97% of your clients at NEPC, they're using this as default. I would think new, if they're using auto enrollment, auto escalation, they're automatically putting them in these funds, but it, does it diminish the role of the investment, the core investment menu? It is diminishing maybe the, the, the usage of it for sure. They, they are equally important, obviously, from a compliance standpoint, we wanna make sure for those investors that have a do-it-yourself mindset that, we, that the options are available. But the trend numbers are strong. Uh, we saw basically, you look at the inverse of the numbers we were talking about, in 2011, 72% of plan assets were in core lineup funds, and now we're down to 56, because it's a zero-sum game. As target date funds gain assets, the relative relationship of target date funds goes up. So what we're actually seeing in plan is that that's a lagging indicator. So that 44% is what's happening be un, at the surface. Under the surface, contributions are close to 60, 65, maybe 70% going towards target date funds. So that's 70 cents on every dollar every two weeks go to a target date fund, which means that 44% on average will eventually close there as they get new contributions, the turnover, the great net resignation you mentioned occurs. We could see over the next five years that 60% of plan assets will be in target date funds, putting more pressure on those assets to drive some of retirement, also putting more focus on fiduciaries on their importance for their participants. Uh, Bill, there's been a big push in the industry from numerous people in groups involved in the ecosystem around managed accounts. Uh, where you know a lot of marketing, uh, a lot of firms creating managed accounts that kind of bolt onto the retirement plan. Where are we with adoption of these managed accounts, and is it something that really resonates with the participant? Yeah, the the push that you mentioned is real, both by the record keeper. And who are offering these. Um, we are seeing strong pushes by them from a marketing standpoint, but we've actually seen a slowdown of adoption. Over the last three years, roughly 37, 36%, now 38% of plans are offering managed accounts. So that says the majority of plans actually do not offer managed accounts if you think about the number in totality. And why is the growth slowed down over the past few years? There's been new entrants into the market. While we know the, their competition may be two or three options per record keeper. So the barriers of entry are high. There is other providers out there that are signaling that the entry point for a managed account could be 15 basis points. And that's actually starting to set a conversation of there's a price war that's happening even off platform that's forcing these providers to reevaluate how they actually enter the market and which is having plan sponsors who are deciding to keep on the sideline as that pricing war sets itself out. As we think about the conversation we just had on target date funds, target date funds and managed accounts are quite similar and where they provide a professional allocation for participants. If you think about it, it's technology that's enhancing. So we need technology to move a little bit faster to bring down the cost. And to answer your last part of your question, roughly about four or 5% of participants who have a managed account available actually use them. And so if we were to see price parity between target date funds and managed accounts, I would actually think that we'd see more adoption in managed accounts. And so that would be the interesting game five or 10 years from now as the two of them actually fight it out. Yeah, well, it could be interesting. And I, that, that number seems to actually align with the use of the self-directed brokerage, which is another uh, feature that has been, I'll say, bolted on. Bill, I need to take a very quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about record keeping and investment management fees on the decline and a lot more. You're gonna to wanna to stay tuned right here on BRN. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We wanna make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 
33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. It's not some magical number, and it's not something we just achieve at the end. It's a feeling of freedom to live our lives the way we intended, through the ups, the downs, all of it. This is financial security, and Lincoln Financial Solutions will help you get there as you plan, protect, and retire. This is Lincoln Financial. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and called Credit Repaired for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report, so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. We're talking this morning to Bill Ryan of NEPC. Bill, thanks so much for staying with us this morning. My pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. All right, Bill, I got to ask you about guaranteed income funds. And I don't know, in Galaxy, long ago in a Galaxy far, far away, back in 2019, there was the passage of the SECURE Act. And then 2020 rolls around, and then we get the HEROES Act, the CARES Act. SECURE Act seems to dissipate, but the SECURE Act had some really important features, one of which was a safe harbor to include guaranteed income products. Where are we with the adoption of these types of products in retirement plans today? Yeah, thank you, Jeff. I think regulation continues to influence how DC plans are managed uh, and how they're designed, both in intended and unintended ways. On our earlier segment, we talked about the, the Pension Protection Act, but we think about the SECURE Act, um, it's definitely increased the volume of conversations on retirement income, but I think the real adoption is for guaranteed income has been more organic. It's probably happened for the past decade or so, as we've seen in smaller formats. And so what do I mean by that? I think plans are having more and more conversations to include guaranteed income, but that road has been telegraphed. For example, UTC, which is now Raytheon, it has been the beacon of that. They probably did it close to 15 years ago. And in the past three to five years, we've seen coming to the forefront um, ahead of the SECURE Act, Yale University, the University of California, and Illinois SERS. And all of those solutions were custom in nature. What I'm starting to hear that's happening since the SECURE Act is actually there's roughly five corporate plans that I'm aware of that are considering signing up for an off-the-shelf target date fund that embeds guaranteed income in that solution. And this organic growth um, it has been needed since UTC, UTC has sent us down this path. Um, one thing that I would say, though, to put this in perspective, is that roughly 88% of our clients who answered our survey have already offered systematic distribution as part of their plan. And so if they have a target date fund and they have systematic distribution, I'd argue that 88% of plans have a retirement income solution. While that may not be the embedded one that you've talked about with guaranteed income, I want to recognize that most plan sponsors are already in the retirement income game and that millions of people each year are taking distributions from their DC plan. And they're doing this in what I would call a self-insured format. And what I mean by that is that they've accumulated enough wealth in their plans to hedge that longevity risk. But as the pension plans continue to wind down and social security plays a role or not, some format of the universe will need some uh, guaranteed income and that may or may not come from a DC plan. So I want to make sure that in context, even a small amount of guaranteed income will benefit these participants going forward. The Department of Labor 
you know, under the Biden administration kind of or has reversed course under the previous administration around ESG. It's offered up some new regulations. Where do you foresee, where does NEPC, you and NEPC foresee ESG having an impact on DC plans? Is it is it as a separate standalone option or is it part of the investment management process? So we believe it's going to happen it, both. And then this is a really interesting conversation because we do foresee greater and greater adoption of environmental, social, and corporate governance options occurring. But as we looked at our survey, 6% of the respondents had an ESG labeled option. I think it's important to distinguish the label versus not. To your point of your question about integration and investment management, actually NEPC's manager research has a subcategory that looks at ESG integration. And from our ratings and most of our buy-less managers, they have a, a highly rated ESG score. And so for that reason, we actually think ESG is more prevalent in DC plans today than we realize. We would anticipate, we uh, expect that close to 30% of the investments that are out there currently have ESG integrated them in how they buy or sell securities. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out if that manifests being true. Uh, some of the DOL items that we're hearing may be a moot item as this becomes more prevalent as part of the investment management process. Yeah, it's yeah, you know, I, I think it's more than a my personal opinion for whatever it's worth. Certainly more than a trend. A lot of people, you look at public sector pension plans, other you know endowments, foundations. People are really using this uh, as a, as as part of their asset allocation. So uh, I guess more to come there. But, you know, Bill, I can't let you go. Um, you know, often often the talk in our business is around fees, record keeping fees, asset management fees, and by all accounts, looking at the NEPC report. They're on the decline, and I think that's good. But is there ever a part where, point where it's too low? And how do you how do you balance low cost um, versus the services that you're providing? Going, going back to the flexibility conversation we had way back uh, in segment one. It's this is probably the, the best question, my favorite question relative to our our survey. It's the most valuable part of our annual survey that we actually provide. So as I mentioned. Earlier, our survey now represents $230 billion in assets and over 1.6 million participants. So from that, year over year, we're seeing real-time pricing trends that you uh, communicate and observe that they are going down, both on the administrative side and the investment fee side. But you know, for a minute, to provide a little bit more detail on that conversation, if we think about how our clients are ranking within those distributions and some of those common averages, there's a bell curve around there for where you sit. Now, although those fees may be reasonable, some of those costs may be dictated based on your, the size of your plan. For example, on the administrative side, if there's a fixed cost for record keeping and you have 5,000 participants or 50,000 participants, that alone could be bringing down the incremental per head cost, still may be, uh, a is a reasonable fee and still may be profitable for the entity. So your question about how low is too low. So some of this is about diminishing fees as the assets scale or the people scale. So with the other thing being that understanding the true drivers of these costs are very important for a prudent process. For example, we've talked about target date funds uh, throughout this segment. Think about the offering of the difference between an all active target date fund and an all passive target date fund. Both may be prudent investments, but may carry a different fee load. If the difference in that fee load is say, 25 basis points and target date funds are half of your plan assets, right there is a 12 basis point differential possibly in your fees relative to another plan. So does it make you, does it make one plan better than another from a process standpoint, but it does explain where you rank. And the other thing maybe we talked about the core lineup and the role of that to the extent that the participant elects between active and passive, they may float you around the ranking. Yeah, well, certainly top of mind for many and given what you know, the Supreme Court weighing in on the Hughes decision and other places, it seems to be at, at, the, at the top of the list, uh, along with cybersecurity and some other really important issues. Bill Ryan, we're going to have to leave it there. Really great seeing you again. Thanks so much for uh, joining us, and we, we appreciate having you on to share your perspective. It was my pleasure, Jeff. I look forward to talking to you again. That wraps up this episode of BRNAM. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the latest in lifestyle, wellness, finance, tech, so much more, all in one place, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Want to check out our latest content or search our archives? Well, visit www.broadcastretirementnetwork.com and our streaming partners, Amazon, Roku, Samsung, and over 100 more. 
We're back again tomorrow. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Now is your opportunity to co-create content around any topic on the first lifestyle and wellness network. Reach a global audience through our platform and co-own exclusive branded content. All of our programs are available on demand and also as audio only podcasts so you can take us on the go. Broadcast Retirement Network, available anytime, anywhere, and on any device. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a tax doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.